He will tell us what happened when antitrust law fails. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for making your way to this session. Uh, I, I traveled for 23 hours uh, on three different flights to get from New York City to Curitiba. Uh, and I'm very happy that I can finally share some of my ideas with you. Today I'm going to talk about antitrust law. How many of you have heard about antitrust? Yeah, some of you. Well, today I'm, I'm not going to be delivering a talk that is strictly about technology. I'm going to try to relate Debian's mission to some social and political issues that the world is facing right now. I'm worried about technology, and I'm worried about its effect on democracy, and I'm worried about its effect on us. At the Freedom Box Foundation, I work on making technology work for democracy, and I work on making technology work for all of us. But I'm not a software developer, and I'm not a software lawyer. I'm a software activist. And I'm trying to use Debian to solve some pretty big issues. Uh, here's one of them. The economy is concentrated. And what this means is that a small number of companies control entire industries. It wasn't always this way. In fact, in the last two decades, over 75% of industries in the United States have experienced an increase in concentration levels. So here's what that looks like. It means that um, industries like IT and transportation and finance used to have a smaller proportion of their uh, market share controlled by the top four firms, but now, as you can see from this graph, a greater proportion of their, uh, top, uh, of, of their market is controlled by the top four firms. Um, so we have a problem, and that is that industry concentration is bad. It's bad for the economy, because it means that there is more anti-competitive behavior being carried out by these companies. And that means that you get less investment in new ideas. That means you have fewer competitors and less competition, and that ultimately means you get less innovation across sectors. But it's also bad for democracy, and it's bad because it means more corporate influence on the political system. That's possible because whenever you have a small number of firms within an industry, it's easier for them to coordinate their activities and come to a shared set of uh, principles that they want to lobby for in government. And so if an industry has six major actors instead of 60, it's easy for them to come together in a trade association and put all of their money into one lobbying firm and lobby for some change in government. But it's also bad because it means more wealth inequality. And that creates an appetite for extremist nationalistic politics. Now, We've actually been through this pattern before. We've been through a pattern of having a gilded age, of having so much concentration in industries that these titans of corporations can control the political system. Here's a cartoon from the 1890s. Back in the 1890s through the, the 1920s, there was so much industry concentration throughout the world, throughout the, throughout the United States, throughout Europe that the people throughout the world wanted something different. They started to demand extreme change. And that's how we got World War II. Okay. The tech industry in particular is concentrated, and its story of concentration uh, is a little unique. Uh, here is uh, a graph which shows you uh, patterns of concentration in, uh, in, in the tech industry. And ever since 1997, uh, a number of the sectors in tech, like data centers, like, uh, like, sorry, um, li like telephone lines, have gotten more and more concentrated. All of the orange dots which are above the line uh, indicate that a subsector within IT has become more concentrated. As you can see, there are only about four or five subsectors in IT that haven't become more concentrated since 1997. And concentration in uh, IT means that we have fewer alternatives. If you're, having problems with, if you're having problems with your telecommunications company, like Comcast, then you have fewer alternatives. 
It also means user lock-in, because once you have network effects on platforms like Facebook, it becomes really hard to leave because that's where all your friends are. And it also means less interoperability, because now these companies at the top have so much control that they can make it difficult for uh, other uh, upstarts to make platforms that compete with the, the major uh, platform by having some kind of an interoperability. This is why Twitter won't make it easy for Mastodon to interoperate. And it also means less freedom for users. Shouldn't there be a law against all of this? If we went through this in the Gilded Age over 100 years ago, why are we putting ourselves through it again? Well, there actually are laws for this. Antitrust and anti-merger laws. Antitrust laws are supposed to break up companies once they get too big, and anti-merger laws are supposed to prevent companies from joining together to create a monopoly. But the law didn't do its job. And there are a couple reasons why. The first reason is uh, George W. Bush. Um, maybe you thought we would never be criticizing George Bush again after Donald Trump became president of the US, but Turns out some of his policies are still affecting the world today. Uh, the Bush administration decided that it would carry out exactly zero anti-monopoly anti antitrust cases. Uh, and it's the responsibility of a presidential administration to carry out these cases through its Department of Justice. It also blocked zero major mergers in its eight years in office. And the second reason why all of this happened, despite the law, is that antitrust ignored tech. It ignored tech because of a myth. The, myth. the myth is that all tech companies eventually decline. How many of you have heard of this myth before? That after five years or so, Facebook is gonna fall and someone else is gonna take its place. After all, that's what happened to MySpace, that's what happened to Friendster, that's what happened to AltaVista, and the list goes on and on. But that myth turned out to be false because concentration happened anyway. In fact, Facebook enjoyed 67 unchallenged acquisitions of its competitors, like Instagram and WhatsApp. Amazon, 91. Google, 214 unchallenged acquisitions. This is important because it means that the major companies at the top of the tech industry were allowed to acquire a lot of power. That myth, that myth had a lot of force, and big tech was born. So the law hasn't done its job. We have to do our job. We have to break up big tech with small tech. And now we can talk about Freedom Box. Freedom Box is a small, simple home server. Most digital services are run by big tech. Almost everything you can do on the internet has to go through a major tech platform uh, if you use the internet in the way that most people do. Messages are run by big tech. WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger. VOIP calls are run by big tech. Social media apps are run by big tech. Blogs, calendars. Why can't we run our own services? Well, that's because most of us don't run a server. After all, servers provide services. And there are always two parts to computing in the digital age. There are servers and there are clients. Our laptops, our smartphones, those are the clients that we use to access the servers. The servers run the software, they have the data, and they have the log files. Servers are at the center of the web and we don't control the center of the web. They do. To regain control of the web, we need to re-decentralize it. And that's where Freedom Box comes in. Freedom Box was founded in 2010 because we anticipated that the web was going to be centralizing. Freedom Box is made out of two ingredients, a software system, which is a Debian pure blend, uh, and hardware, which costs anywhere from 30 to 100 US dollars, uh, we target our hardware towards single board computers. Freedom Box offers 20 plus built-in applications and services like a, mes a messenger, voice calls, a blog, a VPN, Tor, and even more. And it's designed for anyone who wants to regain control of their data. We're trying to make this as easy as possible for non-technical users. So let's start with an overview of the hardware. We picked Debian to be the base of the Freedom Box system because we wanted our system to be universal. We wanted it to be compatible with old laptops, old desktops, and inexpensive single board computers. Uh, that was a very good decision. Um, and we also specifically wanted to create images 
uh, that targeted around 10 or so single board computers so that it would be even easier than just installing Debian. Right now, there are 13 single board computers that we build custom images for, uh, and they're listed right there on our website. And you can build a Freedom Box with materials that most of you probably already have at home. But now let's talk about the software. The software is a Debian pure blend. Now this means a lot of things, but first and foremost, it means that our server system is free as in freedom. There are a lot of competing server systems emerging right now, which are trying to solve the same problem that we are. What makes us special is that we're, we're totally free and we will always be free. Another thing about Debian is that its ecosystem invites competition and innovation. It's not possible for an ecosystem which is based within Debian to have that kind of concentration of industries. It will always be possible for someone running a Debian-based network infrastructure to interoperate and to expand and to give the power to the users, not the people who are providing the servers. And another really important point I want to draw out is that Debian has Interoperabil interoperability built into its services. This is something that we take for granted, but I want to spend some time about it. Our servers are interoperable because when you have a matrix, a matrix instance running on a freedom box, anyone else's matrix, matrix instance on their freedom box can be made to talk to yours. If you, uh, and, and, and that, that same thing applies to any other federated service that you want to install on your Freedom Box. You're never going to be trapped by the software. You're never going to be trapped by the provider because you become the provider of the server. Interoperability promotes innovation. In fact, uh, copyright law in the United States has tended to protect interoperability. Uh, as one uh, scholar, Mark Lemley, notes, Interoperability is the reason that we can even read documents that were written on Mac, on a, Mac, uh, on a, on a Macintosh computer. The fact that the law has insisted that our uh, systems protect interoperability uh, is the reason that we can even do things on different operating systems in the first place. And another argument I want to make is that interoperability may be the best way to fight the silos of big tech. Cory Doctorow wrote a blog a couple of weeks ago for EFF. And what he argues is that we have two options when it comes to big tech. The first is we can try to regulate Facebook, we can try to regulate Instagram and WhatsApp, and we can try to make them more benign. We can try to make them behave in more trustworthy ways. On the other hand, what we could do is we could insist that they impose some interoperable standards so that somebody could, for example, run a diaspora pod which interoperates with Facebook and enables any Facebook user to migrate all of their data to this pod so that they don't have to rely on the Facebook company. That's a pretty powerful idea, but we know that the law moves a little bit slowly. So why not just use a software ecosystem which already exists and already has interoperability built into it? That's why I think Debian is poised to become the alternative in an, in a, in an age in which users feel like they have no alternatives. And yesterday, what I learned uh, in Sam Hartman's very moving uh, talk was that almost everything needs a stable base of dependencies. That should be Debian. I agree. I agree. If we're going to re-decentralize the web, and we're going to do it with single board computers, and we're trying to make it as accessible as possible to everyone throughout the world, then the base of that software system should be Debian. Because Debian has a track record of promoting freedom, promoting interoperability, and gaining the trust of its users. So let's talk a little bit more about the software in Freedom Box. The user interface is democratized. It's designed for non-experts. It's also simple. We want to make it as easy as possible to install an application. And it's streamlined. We want to automate whatever can be automated so that administering a server doesn't require a lot of work. Here are some screenshots of what the first boot looks like. When you first plug in your Freedom Box to your router, you go onto your computer and you type freedombox.local, or you type the local IP address, 192.168.1.8, for example. And you see this button. It says Start Setup. So you click, you click that button. And then you get this prompt. Enter a username and enter a password. You're now creating your administrator account. You wait a few seconds, and then here you go. User account created. You are now logged in. Setup complete. Now you have your own private server. So you click on the button that says Install Apps, and you see our page of apps. These are all the apps which you can install with one click. There is a matrix server for chat. 
There is an IkiWiki server for a blog, OpenVPN, you can run a Tor relay, you can run a calendar, tons of things. And we also have system options like backups and like configuring a free subdomain at freedombox.rocks. So anybody here could make their own subdomain using the settings within a Freedom Box. Um, for example, if your name is Carter, you could do carter.freedombox.rocks as long as that is available. And here's an example of what the installation process looks like. If you want to install uh, an IRC client called Quasel, you just go to the applications page and you click the install button and that's it. Now here's what Freedom Box can do. Here are some examples. Messaging. Matrix and Riot on Freedom Box can be used to replace WhatsApp. Here's a screenshot of a real chat that I ran using a, uh, a Freedom Box that looks exactly like this. Uh, I was running Matrix on the Freedom Box, and I had three different client devices which had the Riot application running. I had two mobile phones and one desktop. Uh, and here's a chat room. Akil and Carol are speaking with the admin, and they even decided to have uh, a VOIP call. Another application called Synthing can replace cloud storage. So now you can have an, uh, a folder on your Freedom Box which synchronizes its contents with that same folder on any client device that you have uh, Synthing installed on. Synthing is available on desktop, it's available on Android, it's available on F-Droid. Uh, so Synthing is a, is a real option for someone who wants to have some uh, file backup on their Freedom Box. Uh, Radical is a calendar application that you can use to replace Google Calendar. I use Radical every day. My calendar is hosted on my Freedom Box. Uh, I have a smartphone which has the stock calendar app, and the stock calendar app is uh, uh, compatible with my Freedom Box calendar server. There's no magic involved here. It's pretty easy. IkiWiki can replace centralized blogging. Uh, this is what an IkiWiki blog looks like when it's right out of the box. But once you do a little bit of work and customize it, you can make it look about as pretty as the Freedom Box Foundation's website, which is running on IkiWiki. MediaWiki can replace centralized teaching platforms. Uh, it always amazes me how easy it is to install an encyclopedia onto your private server. One button. And the good news is you can actually buy a Freedom Box. Freedom Box is not just a free software system which you can install on any hardware you want. It's also a product now. Uh, Olimex in April launched the first ever Freedom Box project. And here it is, I'm holding it in my hand. It's made out of a Lime 2 single board computer which has a gig of RAM and about a gigahertz uh, in processing speed. Uh, yesterday I heard uh, John Mad Dog Hall deliver a talk about his company, Caninos Lucos, and he contrasted it with the original Raspberry Pi. He says that the Raspberry Pi is slower than molasses on a cold day. Uh, you're not going to have that problem with a single board computer like this. I use this every day and I don't have any issues with it. Uh, the case is a black metal with a laser engraved Freedom Box logo and anyone who wants to see it afterwards can come up and see it. We also have a battery in, in, inside of the device which gives you five hours of standalone operation if you ever have a power outage. Uh, I, uh, I, when I lived in the Bronx, New York for a year, I used to have frequent power outages. And whenever you have a, a power outage, you worry that maybe your server is going to have some data corruption in the process. It's good, to make, it's good to have a server which doesn't shut down whenever the power goes off. And it also comes with a 32 gigabyte micro SD card. Uh, with some of the fastest read and write speeds that you can find at this price point. And of course it comes with the cables and right now uh, the cost is 82 euros or 93 US dollars uh, for the entire thing. Of course you can also build your own Freedom Box for um, around 50 US dollars using your own materials that you buy or maybe that you already have. But this is an option that we made just so that it's easy for users who don't want to build their own Freedom Box. With Freedom Box you can break up big tech. The people in this room, you can start a movement to decentralize the web, which will force people, or rather, which will force big tech to make its standards more interoperable so it can compete with the services that you are providing your friends. And some people argue that small can't replace big. Some argue that it's impossible that a network of freedom boxes could ever overcome the might of WhatsApp. Well, no one dreamed that the personal computer, once little more than a toy for hobbyists, would displace the mighty mainframe. That's what Tim Wu says. And 
as you all know, the personal computer did displace the mainframe. Most people my age don't even know what a mainframe is. Personal computers displaced mainframes. Personal servers can displace centralized servers. But that's only if we do something about it. So let's make it happen with Freedom Box. Let's make it happen with Debian's own private server system. So what can you do today? Well, if you're inclined, you can buy a Freedom Box and start using it. You can make your own as well. If you're inclined, you can donate to the Freedom Box Foundation so that we can continue to host our own infrastructure. You could also lead. You can become a network manager. That is, you can become a volunteer who runs your own network of Freedom Boxes for your local community. And what the Freedom Box Foundation will give you in return is uh, free consulting, free advice, and maybe even free hardware. Uh, we have two network managers right now. One is based at Yale Law School, another is based at Cornell Law School. And they're using their Freedom Boxes to provide services to their legal communities. Uh, we are open to anyone who wants to run a Freedom Box in any context. Talk to me, uh, send an email to the foundation if you want to learn more about this. There's the contact info. Another thing that we need is code. Now, the real reason I traveled across the hemisphere to deliver this talk is that I knew that I would meet a lot of Debian developers in this room. And we need more Debian developers. Uh, most of the developers for Freedom Box come directly from the Debian community, because we're a Debian pure blend. Uh, and it would be a really natural and uh, logical next step for the people in this room to join our community. Uh, specifically, in 2019, we're trying to add an email server to the Freedom Box system. Uh, we're also thinking about event management software so that people can replace Facebook events and Eventbrite. And it's easier to organize um, political activity using uh, event management software. And we're also trying to package some uh, Fediverse social network applications, something maybe like Mastodon. Maybe somebody could help us try to package Mastodon uh, for Debian. That way, it'd be really easy to put it in Freedom Box. If anybody here wants to help us with these or any other tasks, please look us up, find us on our forum, on our IRC channel, join our community. We really, really need you at this time. So let's break up big tech with small tech. Thank you very much. OK, uh, here are my citations. And now we can move on to some questions. Hello. Um, maybe I missed it, but what architecture is it running on? That specific hardware and in general? Sorry, could you? I couldn't hear you. Could you speak yeah. into the mic? Okay, I think it's on now. Maybe so you. I think it's okay now, right? I think people should use it. So which architecture is it running? Is it AMD64 or ARM? And in specific, this uh, um, box that you just showed. Uh, it can run, so this is ARM, but uh, it can run on anything that Debian can run on. Small follow-up to previous questions. Yeah. Uh, so let's assume that I don't want to run pure Freedom Box, but I already have some Debian computers. So how easy it would be to install applications in similar way that Freedom Box runs to have some compatibility or to be able to provide you feedback if something is wrong? OK. So you're asking how easy would it be to install Freedom Box on an existing Debian installation? Or, or just some of the apps? Yes. Just some of the apps, okay. So if you want to install just some of the apps on an existing Debian installation, then uh, it, will, it should be very easy to make those interoperate with the apps on somebody else's Freedom Box. And that's because they're, they're running the same packages. So if you want to install a Matrix server on some old Debian laptop without installing Freedom Box on it, then just install all the packages that Freedom Box installs, which should be easy because they're all from Debian. And then from there, we're pretty much operating in the, in the same realm. So are you providing your repository or some virtual packages to install all that's needed so I don't have to uh, 
hunt for which packages are you installing on uh, well, Gnome Box? Right, so if you want more information about what, what packages we're installing, what's bundled within the system, you can go to our wiki. It's wiki.debian.org slash freedombox, and you'll see a very extensive manual. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Another thing is that when you install applications uh, within the Freedom Box system, above the status bar, it actually flashes the text of the individual packages that are being downloaded and installed as they're being installed. So that's another way to kind of look under the hood and see exactly what you're getting. So another follow-up question to that. You mentioned that Freedom Box is a pure blend. So are you actually implementing the apps as task packages or something, or is that some Freedom Box specific thing? The way that you bundle apps into probably Debian packages and some configuration, or can you elaborate on how the app install is different to an app get install, basically? Well, it's the same. It's the same. Okay, it's the same. Yeah. At least the last time I looked at it, there was a package called Plinth that has basically the configuration GUI, and, and basically they've written a, a system management interface, which is, again, since it's Debian Pure Blend, it's part of Debian, um, that makes, that allows you to do, that, that basically makes Debian easier to use for that community. Um, and, you, you know, you can go take you can go take a look at the source of that or go take a look at it running on a Freedom Box image. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I think I was just basically asking whether there's a one shot package you would install under the hood or is there like a set of packages? But never mind. Um, I have another, maybe more controversial question. So um, okay. you mentioned the zero merger blocks by the Bush administration. Uh, do you have any data on how much the um, Obama administration actually blocked? Because I'm not sure how much better it was in the end. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the question is, uh, if the Bush administration did absolutely nothing about antitrust, what about the Obama administration? They had eight years in office as well. Uh, there is data about that. I don't have it. Um, I know that they did do more than the Bush administration. However, it still wasn't enough because the Obama administration also operated under the same myth, the myth that Big, that, that, that tech moves quickly, that there is a five-year cycle of companies rising and falling. And so that's why even after we had somebody who believed in antitrust to take office, it wasn't enough. That myth was still so powerful. Uh, we, we have seen uh, this year also uh, movement from, from purism to, to like to run, uh, as they say, trusted services and services that don't spy on users. H how do you see this relationship between having everyone have their own freedom box at home and having companies providing services for maybe a larger set of people? Okay. Then you could uh, reasonably host on a single freedom box, for I instance. See. So the question is, if I, if I heard it right, right now there are some more trusted services that are emerging, and they're supposed to be an alternative to Google Drive, for example. Uh, what would I say if somebody asked me, should I use this new trusted service, which is hosted on someone else's servers, or should I run it on a Freedom Box? Um, my stance still is that if given a choice, you should run it on a Freedom Box, because you control the data, you control the logs. Um, one of the, the reasons relates to uh, the way that the law works in the United States. In the United States, you have a Fourth Amendment right uh, to have some, some privacy to materials which are in your own home. So if you have a Freedom Box server in your own home and law enforcement wants to get to it, they need a warrant. They need a warrant to enter your home and then get to the Freedom Box. If instead that same data is being hosted on somebody else's servers, the law enforcement uh, isn't going to need a warrant, uh, the same kind of warrant to get to it, so it'll be easier. Now they can have some sort of data sharing agreement with that company so that they can look through the data. Now, these companies which are trying to provide trusted services are, are, are trying to find ways around that, uh, but at least in the US, the safest way to have your own data safe is to keep it in your own home. Um, and another reason why I still 
really think that we should be using freedom boxes instead of these centralized trusted alternatives is that they solve the problem of a centralized web. What good will these trusted services be if they're still just as centralized as the status quo? If we have all of these, if, I mean, if Ma Mastodon would be great if everybody on Twitter moved to Mastodon, but it would be even better if everybody on Twitter moved to 1,000 different Mastodon instances. So I think that we should still strive to spread our digital assets as widely as we can, because when we put them in one place, th then they're all running uh, on the same software. And when there's one bug that affects that one software system, then it affects everybody's data. Uh, one of the reasons why Linux uh, is, is considered so secure is that people are running so many different distributions that if there's some zero day that somebody finds, it's unlikely that it's, that it's going to affect everybody running a Linux distribution. There are so many of them. Uh, and so if you want to spread everybody's digital assets in a safe way, let's have an ecosystem of different private server systems. There will be Freedom Box over here, Why You Know Host over there, and a bunch of other ones. And now it's going to be even harder to take all of them down at the same time. Hope that answers your question. How about data encryption? I, I can't imagine how to boot one of these things up and enter a password, but I would like it to be all encrypted. Yeah. Uh, yeah, good question. So the question is, what about encryption? Now, I'm, I'm not a developer, and I don't specialize in any of this, so uh, all I can tell you is the current status. The current status is that uh, we do not yet support full disk encryption. There isn't yet full disk encryption. Um, but there are other security measures that we take that, that you can look, uh, look through on our, on, our on our wiki and on our website. Hi. 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 Thank you for your talk, very interesting project. Congratulations. Uh, the motivation of it uh, inspires, at least inspires me a lot. Uh, and the package seems, seems pretty. I would like to see it afterwards. I would like to ask you a little bit more about the, the network manager thing you, you said, yeah. uh, connecting to the previous question, the, to your previous answer. What, how does it work in terms of trying to spread this, trying to create a network, if I understood it right, uh, you're also trying to create a network of freedom boxers. I mean, to try to use the system to uh, spread this idea of distributing things. How are you connecting this? You said there are two, two places. Two of them, that yeah. So the question is, how, how are we going to connect all of these network managers? So right now, the goal is not to make each network manager federate with the other one. So uh, our two network managers at Yale and Cornell, as far as I know, none of their services are federated together. They're actually just serving their uh, local communities and they have more than one freedom box that are running together. But, but you have, you have uh, something that connects them uh, to you, because you said... No, we don't. No, Good, you don't. That, that's a great question. Uh -huh. Let me clarify. So the question now is, aren't all of these network managers connected to us at the Freedom Box Foundation? And uh, the answer is no, and that's because they run all the software on their own, and they host it on their own server, which we don't see, we don't touch, we don't know about. We don't gather usage data, uh, we don't gather statistics about how many downloads there are of our image. That's why I can't tell you how many thousands of freedom boxes there are in the world. Uh, we don't want to know how many freedom boxes there are because we want you to have that information private. Um, and so this is a really important point that I, I, I get asked about at conferences a lot. What good is freedom box if it's just going to be the next Google? Um, well, the good news is we can't be because we don't control your data at all. It's like if I sell you a Swiss Army knife, uh, you can do what you want with it. I'll never see. I don't know. Sorry, I don't know if I'm getting too much time. This is a, a simple question. Okay. Uh, in terms of hardware, what, what do you have inside that box, mostly? So, uh, so uh, if y this is running uh, a Lime 2 single board computer. Uh, it's made by a company called Olimex. Olimex makes open source hardware. That's why we wanted to uh, do a deal with them. Um, you can also run a Raspberry Pi 2. You can also run boards made by Pine64 or the, the Banana Pro, there are, there are all sorts of them. But uh, in case you don't know, a single board computer is basically, it, it, it's, it's just all the material that you need to have a computer condensed down to one board. You can imagine a smartphone from 2012. That's basically what this is, except without the screen. So I have a question, do you have a Nextcloud on it? Yeah, good question, no we don't. <laughs> 
we used to have own cloud on it back when it was a Debian package, uh, but we don't have Nextcloud because Nextcloud is not a Debian package. Uh, that's one of the drawbacks of being a Debian pure blend. Uh, I've spoken with the folks, the higher ups at Nextcloud, and they're enthusiastic about Freedombox and Nextcloud coming together, but they aren't so enthusiastic about making Nextcloud into a Debian package because that represents a set of commitments that I don't think they're ready to make. So if somebody here wants to package Nextcloud for Debian, you'll do the world a great service because now we can make it a Freedom Box package. Yeah, I have a follow up question because if, if, you, if you, you need a, 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 such a cloud service to store your private data in, in your hand, so it would be the small computer would be too, too, too small. It's like 32 gig you have there. Yeah, good question. So uh, the, the, the question is, isn't the Freedom Box going to be too small to host all your private data? Uh, well, it depends on how much your data you're trying to host. Um, and it depends on what you're using for storage. So this has a 32 gigabyte SD card in it. It is going to be too small to host all of my music. But what I could do is use the SATA port to plug in an external hard drive and sit that right next to the Freedom Box. So now it does have the storage. Uh, do you know if Freedom Box could run on Caninos Locos, or have you ever tried, or someone in the team developing Freedom Box have ever tried running on Caninos Locos? Yeah, so the question is, what about Caninos Locos? Can't Freedom Box run on that? Uh, the answer is, we haven't tested it yet, but probably. And the reason I say probably is that Caninos Locos is being targeted for Debian specifically. They're trying to make uh, Debian fully compatible with it. And if Debian is fully compatible with it, then Freedom Box will be. Um, I would love to work with uh, the fine uh, ladies and gentlemen of Caninos Lucos to deliver Freedom Box to Brazil. If they want to work with us, we'll work with them. Hi. What about updates? You have this tiny little box and is it's doing auto updates or yeah. what's the user responsible to do this themselves? Or what yeah, good question. So what about updates? Um, there are two things to say here. This gets automatic security updates um, whenever they are pushed. And they're pushed from the upstream Debian packages, so we don't have to control that ourselves. Uh, and that is true of the stable images, the testing, the unstable, the experimental. Um, and there is also a page uh, where you can manually click the update button and see if there are any new updates to any of your packages. Um, one more point I want to make about updates is if you're this will be uh, obvious to a lot of the people in the room. But if you're running the stable image, then you're not going to be getting the latest updates that we're pushing to uh, our, our testing branch. If you're running the testing image, then you're going to be getting uh, new software features once every two weeks, actually. Um, now, we did enable uh, backports on the latest Buster stable uh, release, which means that hopefully we can push some new features into even the stable versions on a regular basis. But generally, your software, if you're running the stable image, your software should look pretty uh, normal. It shouldn't change at all for about two years. How does Freedom Box handle when a new Debian release is made? For instance, if I had a Freedom Box a couple of months ago running Stretch, what does it, how do I upgrade it to Buster? Does it work? Did a, anybody try it? Yeah. So, uh, it, it, it depends, yeah, so this is a complicated question, and I, I'm not, I don't have a great answer for it, because we're actually still f working it out right now. Um, if your Freedom Box is set to get its uh, software from the testing repository, then it'll continue to run testing. But if it's p uh, pointed at Buster, then once Buster went stable, uh, people needed to manually SSH into their Freedom Box and uh, answer a prompt which said, uh, do you approve of the uh, upgrade from testing to stable? And then they had to uh, enter Y for yes, and then it, it, it updated to, to the latest stable image. Um, unfortunately, that was an oversight. We, we could have avoided that. We could have made a frictionless update from uh, Buster testing to Buster stable, but that was a mistake that our, our developers made. What I meant was from, from the previous table to the current table. So we are running Stretch, and then Buster is released, and I want to run Debian stable, the newer stable, because I'm not sure why you're doing this, but nobody should be running servers on testing. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. I think you want to say something? So, yeah, I, when you say that that was a mistake your developers made, no, that was a mistake we as a community made. Ah. We 
I think there were many of us who were um, a little bit surprised release morning, or release, you know, next day release morning to get that little message prompt. And yeah. um, I think this is an area where we as Debian need to do a little bit better testing of um, changes in a certain area. Um, and I think that your story is an excellent illustration of how um, Debian has some really great testing, but we need to even have better testing around things that affect the archive like that so that your developers had some chance of being aware. Yeah, thank you. If anyone has more questions about that issue, please direct it to our forum or our mailing list. Yeah, I think we're So thank you very much for a very, very interesting uh, presentation. I just want to uh, finally say many thanks for actually going to pure blend uh, the way and not having third party repositories and doing it in Debian. I think that's very much appreciated. Thanks a lot for all your work. Thank you. Thank you.